So you've got data on your computer somewhere in memory, which is pretty great. That said, these days everyone and their dog has a computer, so it would be great if we could take the list of numbers in one computer and make it appear in this other computer. Well, we could temporarily connect a memory device to our CPU, copy the data over, disconnect it, and do the reverse on the destination PC. But this is a little bit clunky, and in the age of accelerating interconnectivity, far too inefficient. What if we just connected the two computers with a wire? I said a computer is something that manipulates memory, so that's not quite right. What if we added a little chunk of memory to each computer, and then built special hardware that connected the memory together? Hardware that would automatically take whatever values are in the memory buffer for outgoing data, the transmission or TX buffer, and pass these values through to some connection medium where they'll be stored on the receiving end in a receive or RX buffer. Implement this in both directions and you have a bi-directional transmission system. Look at the ends of an ethernet cable, it's just a bunch of wires. It's actually gotten a lot more complicated, what goes on between those special chunks of memory could really be anything, as long as it deterministically makes the RX buffer match the TX buffer. This could be a pair of wires carrying a digital signal and a clock. It could be high frequency data signals multiplexed onto a long range carrier wave or something in between. This spans the fields of digital communications and analog communications and is beyond the scope of this discussion. Now, point to point communication solves a lot of problems, but we want more. A computer with two of these devices isn't enough. So we make a special computer that has a bunch of these systems and connect a bunch of PCs to it. Each system is assigned a unique ID number. This special computer is a switch and helps route traffic to the computer with the matching destination ID. This is likely what your home's internal network looks like. If you know the ID of the computer you want to talk to, the destination address, you can glue it to the beginning of your packet. Each computer in the system stores the IDs of what it's connected to in a big list, so you can let them figure out how to route the data to the correct place. Well, some computers have longer lists than others, so your message might get round robin through the network until it finds a routing table with an entry that matches your message's destination. Your computer's ID is also written into the message, so the target computer can send data back. Since numbers are hard to remember, we can name these computers, assigning a series of letters to each series of numbers in the system. The computer translates back and forth for us. But we aren't finished. After all, we want to communicate with other people, don't we? So we pay a company to connect our house to all the houses in our neighborhood, town, city, region. They have a bunch of very large, very special computers that just manage a bunch of these connections, and they connect to other really large computers in other cities or regions. There are even giant cables connecting continents laid along the bottom of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. But this still isn't enough to satisfy us. So we built towers and devised communication schemes that let us connect to this network wirelessly from almost anywhere on the planet using devices we can hold in our hands. We put communication systems into space to communicate from the places that network couldn't reach. Now humans are making satellite networks that'll cover the entire Earth. Companies sprang up to correlate names to all the addresses on this network. Others built databases that fill warehouses to index what all these computers are sharing and enable us, humans, to sort through it all, which is rather convenient. That said, how does the computer interface with the various communication modalities? How does the computer and our software actually access these data streams? Well, it's Linux, so we use a file. And I do mean a file. Many of the details regarding these specific communication devices implementation is abstracted out by the time we get to the CPU itself. And whatever remains is abstracted out by the kernel and drivers. We are presented some block of memory to interface with. The operating system takes that memory and handles all the arbitration, handshaking, and translating necessary to operate the communication peripherals. A file is something stored in computer memory. This is a human concept. The computer just sees a bunch of registers, some containing metadata describing which registers hold what data. 
the organization of these memory locations into a structure, the file hierarchy, is something we use to conceptualize and manage information. A file is a collection of data stored in computer memory. The communication peripherals interface is a collection of data stored in computer memory, which means we can treat it as a file. That said, it is a bit special. And since it serves as the connector or outlet between our software and something else, we could call it a socket. Just like when you open a file, the socket call gives you a file descriptor, the location of our communication control file in memory. From there, we need to set our local parameters, the port, and then specify our outgoing parameters, the destination address and the destination port. From there, you can write data out or read data in, and the rest of the work is taken care of for us, hopefully. TCP has some verification checks to make sure your data has been received. UDP carpe diems your message out into the world, figuring that it's not our problem anymore. The computer on the other end will have to be powered on and have some software running to detect the incoming data, process it, and if applicable, respond in kind. This handshaking is generally handled by the programmer in software, so you or me. There's a decent amount of code and a lot of debugging, but at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward. Specify a destination, create the socket file descriptor, and read or write data. Dealing with the external world is always messy, hence the debugging and error checking. What's important to note is a network connection is point to point, defined by a destination address and a source address. Both these values get appended to the data that's sent from your computer out into the network. Which means every computer that sees this packet sees this data. It's not terribly difficult for entities to extract identifying information from this. In an economy where personal information is a huge commodity, this can be unnerving. VPNs have become popular recently and they advertise themselves as obfuscating this information. So here's some random commentary about that. Put simply, a VPN takes the packet with the destination address you want and the source address, your computer, and swaps the destination out with their server, shoving the website you specified into the data portion of the packet. When it gets to their computer, they should swap out your computer's source address with their server's source address, put the destination back, and send it out. When a response is received, it does the reverse and sends the data back to you. So in terms of privacy, you have the benefit of not blasting your personal IP to every website host you reach out to. That said, all your internet traffic is now going through a single entity. Put a different way, one organization knows every single thing you look at on the internet. Since you're paying them for this privilege, that profile is linked to an account, which is linked to an identity, your identity. That doesn't necessarily mean these companies are nefarious and or selling that data, but some of them seem to throw an awful lot of money around. I've recently been doing a decent amount of network programming for a few of my projects. The principles are surprisingly simple, but it gets messy really quickly, especially when you're trying to make your code robust on an embedded processor. There's a lot of external randomness to deal with because your software has to interface with foreign software running on a foreign device somewhere in the real world. But that's life, I guess, and software development.